Hey there, folks. So I've been cleaning out my uh, workspace, uh, my, my lab, as it were. Um, found a console that I totally forgot about, and, um, well, it's finally time to put this miserable thing out of its misery. Uh, <laughs> so this SP is an amalgam of parts that I've just had laying around and then assembled because it worked and I needed it for testing something, and works totally fine, but it's horrifying as an actual console. So let's see if we can't fix that uh, with some of the parts I've got here. Um, so I have effectively done this video before. Uh, Funny Playing sent out a prototype of their um, new SP housings, and I went ahead and assembled that and did a DIY ITA uh, backlight kit in this thing using the Game Boy Advance version, and it works. They're were are a few quirks. Um, notably, this one never had little rubber bumpers. I had to fit a completely different backlight kit in here. That's whatever. It doesn't matter. I'll I'll link it in the description. Um, but now I've got the retail housing with some buttons here. Ah, uh, and the retail backlight kit, mostly with one notable exception. Uh, so this is the packaging it ships in. Um, the purpose of this packaging is to prevent damage in shipping. Uh, unfortunately, my little box, one of the latches did get damaged, but since this arrived relatively intact, I haven't actually tested this yet, so hopefully there's no issues. Um, normally I test these things before the video, but you'll see why in a moment. Um, anyway, one of the latches got damaged, but it did its purpose, so I'm not too butthurt about it. Um, I see people complaining that, that these things get damaged in shipping, and it's like, well, yeah, that kind of sucks, but it's not actually included with the kit, you know, it's it's just kind of like a, a, a bonus thing, and, you know, if this gets damaged in shipping and they didn't include it, you know, think of what would happen to your LCD. Anyway, again, I'm getting sidetracked. We're only two and a half minutes in and I'm already rambling. Anyway, um, we'll take a closer look at this stuff in a moment. Let's go ahead and start off with the uh, backlight kit itself. So we've got this um, adhesive foam here. It's very thin foam, but uh, I believe the purpose is for insulation um, as well. Black foam just kind of looks good, especially in a transparent housing. Uh, we've got the ribbon cable adapter. Do, do, do. And a single short wire. Very short wire. The purpose of this wire is uh, you solder it up to one of these two pads here, and then you can attach it to the um, brightness button, I think. That is absurdly short. I hope that's long enough. Anyway, uh, the ribbon cable itself is pretty similar to ones we've seen in the past from Funny Playing. Uh, the layout is a little bit different, but it is effectively just the Game Boy Advance ITA kit, but on the uh, SP ribbon form factor, things are somewhat rearranged. Um, function and feature-wise, this should be pretty similar to the other ITA kits. And then last but not least is the display assembly with a fully laminated glass lens uh, to the DSi LCD. That's why these things are called ITA kits. I, DSi, T, 2, A, GBA, it, I don't know. It's not really an acronym. It's kind of silly, but it is what it is. Um, anyway, this kit is a retail kit. Uh, but after some very strong feedback, Funny Playing has decided to make some changes to the kit. Uh, so if you were an early adopter, this is probably the one that you got. Um, but by the time this video goes up, there's probably going to be a change, or at least by the time you're watching this video, I have no idea what their timeline is. Uh, but long story short, this kit does require soldering. It's a little bit advanced too, so um, unlike the other ITA kits, this is not drop-in. The 
final version, the, the revised version, I guess it is, uh, will not require soldering, um, or should not. Uh, it should be plug and play, but if you want to use all the extra features, you will need to do some soldering. They don't, looks like they aren't using any touch sensors on this kit, which for better or worse is what it is. Uh, but anyway, we need to desolder the backlight ribbon from the LCD and then solder it up to this bad boy. So that's why I haven't tested it yet because I wanted to show that off. So before I even tear this thing down, we're going to start that. So the idea is, let me get my example up here. This gets connected right about here and then you're supposed to fold this cable over to fit into this connector but with that attached you can't. There's not nearly enough slack. Uh, in fact with this attached you can't even fold this behind so it's not going to fit in the housing. But got our soldering iron. Let's get some fresh solder on here. And then I'm just going to gently lift while both of those are molten, and then I've got my cable up. Now we can come back, and I'm going to stick this down to try and make my life easier, uh, and because there's some adhesive on the back already. I am probably going to mess up the alignment because of who I am as a person. I don't know why they send you all this foam when the uh, instructions say, hey, you just need a little bit. It could, could pre-cut it for you, because that, I don't know, that just seems kind of silly. Anyway, we're going to cut off about that much. Maybe. There we go. Peel that off. And we're going to stick the foam right underneath the ribbon here. There's no particular alignment that you need to hit, just Keep in mind if you're using a transparent shell, it's going to be visible, so as well try for the best. Oh no, I cut it just a little bit too long. Oh well, I think it'll still be fine. All right, and so now we can fold this up. To attach here. And I'm going to go ahead and crease the ribbon, make sure it's nice and flat, just like that. And then we can fold this down. And solder that up right there. I'm gonna go ahead and tin. Ooh, that was dangerous. Don't forget to uh, wipe your iron off whenever you put it away. Um, there was a solder ball on here that just dropped off as I, uh, as I pulled the iron out and it splatted on my desk right at the edge. Um, like a quarter inch from the edge and uh, you know on the other side of the edge is my leg. I've done that before and it sucks. 
I really don't like doing it. Okay. Let's tin these up again, just in case. After we solder it, we have to fold this down so there's already going to be plenty of slack. It's just kind of a pain in the butt to... Oh, that should work. Easy. So with that like that, we can then fold that back on itself, and we're good to go, finally. All right. I don't have to tape it down or anything, the housing is going to hold all of this in place once it's actually assembled. Um, and like I said, funny playing is aware that this is not exactly ideal as far as um, way to ship these kits so they're looking into they haven't disclosed the details I have no idea what they're doing uh, but they're looking into just getting this soldered up themselves so that when you get the kit it should look something like this already and you shouldn't have to solder it unless of course like I said you're an early adopter that is unfortunately the cost to being an early adopter. I don't know that we need the rest of this, so I'm going to put it aside for now, save it for later. Now we can go ahead and begin with the testing and the disassembly of this bad boy. So let me grab... I used whatever screws were on my desk at the time. So don't pay any attention to whatever tool I'm grabbing to take this apart. Oh, hey! That looks familiar. These things popped up on the market recently, and um, interestingly enough, Funny Playing is even using one in the same tutorial that I'm following to do this, and uh, I don't know, I, I got a few samples in. They, they tested wildly inconsistent, so the ones that were good were good, but they weren't all good, so... Did I miss something? No, it's just sticky. Uh, okay, so this one is missing springs for the shoulder buttons. That's no big deal. I've got dozens of springs. Um, I'd say there's potentially water damage, but realistically I think I had to do some repairs to this thing and then just threw it in the ultrasonic, so it's probably fine. I mean, it worked when I tested it, so... Anyway, let's do some power usage testing. Get a baseline here. Wow, that's labeled on the bottom. Interesting. I am skeptical. Okay. I don't want to get those backwards because I don't want to replace a fuse right now. So we'll get a baseline number. Oh good, it's already set to 3.7. So 
we'll get a baseline number with the same game I always test every other kit with, and then this will go in the um, spreadsheet with the rest. Alright, so Pokemon Emerald, stock Game Boy Advance SP with the front light on. Uh, at 3.7 volts in game, this thing is pulling between 61 and 62 milliamps. Very consistent. Oh, it just went up to 65. So between 61 and 65. I, I have the volume on, and the louder the sound, the more power the amp uses, so it's generally why I tend to give an average. Um, if you have the sound off, it should use less power, so muting that goes down to 60 and 61 milliamps, but we'll give it the benefit of the doubt and test it with sound on. Alright, now that we have our baseline, let me get this bad boy torn down. Flip it up until I have enough uh, play in there to get my finger in to release the bale. Drop the ribbon cable out, and then that's all we need. Um, obviously, I've got some retro CNC buttons in here. I'm not going to be transferring these over to the new shell, um, not because I have anything against them, but because I actually ripped apart a slate to get these buttons. And at some point, I'd rather like to replace the uh, cheap chrome brass ones with the actual brass ones again, so. But needless to say, even after months of abuse, had no issues. Interesting. Anyway, moving on. That's a tangent I really don't want to go down right now. Uh, oh, let's do testing before I continue tearing this thing down. Is that wire even long enough? I mean, I guess so if you solder it directly to the button. Interesting. The instructions show that it comes with a longer wire, so I don't... I don't know what happened here. <laughs> anyway. I believe that was that. Means that's that. I can drop that in there. Hey, it works. Excellent. Volumes up. Oh. I think I hit the power switch. Alright, so in-game, at whatever level of brightness this is, the default-ish, uh, this console is pulling at 3.7 volts, uh, 90, 89 to 93 milliamps. So, quite a bit more, but not actually that bad, all things considered. Uh, I think we've still got a little bit we need to do. Um, for example, I can't actually test the other brightness levels without soldering that wire up, and with how 
the controls on this kit works. I'm not even going to try doing it with tweezers. Uh, but I think we're good to go to continue. We know the kit works, so we can go ahead and carry on with the install. that away yet because I still want to grab some numbers for the highest brightness I suppose I could do that after the video but if I say that now it will never get done all right let's continue tearing this thing down because even though we're not reusing any of these parts I do need to pull the hinges out of it and by far the easiest way to do that is by actually taking it apart Oh, and I totally ruined the screw cover. On the one hand, I wasn't planning on reusing it, but on the other hand, now I can't. Well, I mean, I guess I can, but... I like using a uh, plastic tool to get these out because if you use a metal tool there is a significantly increased likelihood of scratching the housing or just totally destroying these screw covers. Ooh, I am on a roll though. Both of these are torn up. They're salvageable, but eesh. Nope, never mind. Yeah, I know, bud. I can't believe I did that myself. He's lecturing me. There we go. Man, something is up with these. They're really soft to the point where they just rip coming up from the adhesive. That's atypical, but I have seen it before. I don't know what causes it. I'm going to rip that big one, too. Alright, combined with the mold in the screen, I think this thing is going straight in the trash once I'm done. That's a shame. No sense being gentle now. I've already ruined every single other one. All right, and usually the adhesive comes out with those, but it didn't for any of these. But it doesn't matter too much. Just means you gotta peel it off if you wanna reuse the screws. Suppose we don't need to. But... Oh, I've skipped a step. 
Got to remove this hinge cover to get the screen out. And it just drops right out. All right, now we're left with just the bare housing. Um, I'm not gonna save any of this because it's gross and destroyed and there's zero point. Okay, now I need, I made a tool for this and had a whole bunch 3D printed. Um, but the whole point of the tool is to try and extract these hinges without damaging the clips. So it has a little scoop in there and then a pin in the center. The scoop is to try and depress the clips and then the pin is what actually pushes on it. Uh, but, I mean, I suppose if you're a barbarian you can just jam a screwdriver in there and pop them out. Oh man, they usually do not come out that violently. <laughs> left one has always been a pain in the butt because you can't get it out with the shell open so you have to release the clips then open it and then you can push it out ta-da save this all my clips are intact do keep in mind that these are directional there are two hinges uh, you might notice one of them has black clips the other one has white clips on consoles that have directional hinges black goes on the left white goes on the right I believe there are some later models, uh, like AGS 101 consoles, um, IQ models, etc., that have a universal hinge design. Um, unfortunately, I haven't run into any of those in the wild, but I have seen aftermarket repros of them, and eh, they seem alright. Problem is with the aftermarket hinges, quality is kind of hit and miss. Sometimes they're good, sometimes not so much. All right, so we have to use one of the new funny playing shells for this particular screen mod because the uh, LCD is just so freaking large. If we were to try dropping this into an OEM housing, you see it. It interferes with the screw posts on both the top and the bottom. So you can shift it to adjust so it doesn't hit any of the screw posts, but then it completely covers the other ones. Uh, so that is that is the reasoning behind the um, modified shell with the screw posts where they are. In this housing just drops right in. And clears all the screw posts. And you don't have to worry about it. And it's great. And everybody's happy. Anyway. Let's start by joining these together. I need these. We want to get the hinge covers clipped off their sprue. Then you can slide the old ones off and slide the new ones on. Um, ooh, it's probably worth noting that these hinge covers don't fit on the aftermarket hinges anyway, so you'll need to salvage some. Uh, to reinstall, you just gotta open up the shell. If you look down the hinge hole, um, it's gonna be almost impossible for me to show on video. But you can 
try different angles. You could see there's a channel in there that lines up when it's at approximately this angle. That channel is also on the hinge itself. You just gotta get that lined up with the front and the back. And then, come on. They're tight, but it went in. Ta-da. And just like that, nice, clicky. Most importantly, for feel, it closes itself, it stops when it's open, etc. All right, I suppose we can start here and peel that off, drop it in. Give that ribbon one loop there to reduce the strain from repeated opening and closing. I can uh, seat the LCD where it's supposed to be. There we go. There we go, just like that. There are little, um, oh good, there's no rattle or anything. There are little uh, like vinyl cutouts you can get uh, put over this to hide some of the cool electronics, but in my opinion, if you're getting a clear housing, like why, that's a waste. If you're getting a clear housing, is it not to look at the neat interior. Eh, to each their own. Uh, anyway, I should have done this first. Uh, uh oh. I don't know which is which. It doesn't matter, but okay. I'm gonna go ahead and sort out the screws. You don't have to sort them, but it helps me. I'm gonna do it. We have two different lengths. We have long screws and we have short screws. So I'm just gonna throw them all in two piles. Okay, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten short screws and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven long screws. So four of these long screws are for the four corners on the bottom housing. One is for the hinge cover. That leaves two. I believe these two are for the shielding, which leaves us one, two, three short screws for the motherboard. Those are important that they be short. Uh, one, two, three, four, five screws for the top housing, and then two for the remaining bottom housing. Good. All of these screws are crosshead. None of them are um, tri-wing, like OEM. Tri-wing, tri-point. Why? <laughs> actually a nice breath of fresh air and I wish they'd do it with all their other housings too. And because we're screwing metal into plastic, um, bottom out the screw and then back it up just a quarter turn to make sure it's not too tight.
And just like that. Go ahead and install the hinge cover. One of the long screws. Don't forget the light pipe. Uh, I'm going to use this one. Maybe. There it goes. Uh, oh, before I get this stuff installed, I guess let's go ahead. Oh! Came with new screws, that's convenient. Or screws, screws, springs. All right. I'm gonna use a different wire. I don't know why this one's so short. Hopefully that's not a thing. I think I've got a drawer full of various lengths of assorted wires. Add that to that. Because I never get rid of anything. And I want a black one for aesthetics. Do I have a black one? How about that? Eh. I don't want to use something with too thick a gauge. Mm, okay, I guess we'll use white wire. Mm. I'll just use red. It'll be fine. It's not what I want, but it is what it is. the way I want. Probably makes more sense to solder this up before trying to assemble it, but here we are. No, oh, that's too big. There are two pads on here. It does not matter which one you use. Oops. Though I recommend the bigger one just for ease of soldering. drawer in backwards, now there's no handle to pull it out. That's okay, I didn't actually slide it all the way in conveniently. In the end of this bad boy here. And we're gonna solder up to the Q12B test pad. Uh, right underneath 
the um, LED button, the front light button, and right up and to the right of the right button. And there we go. Set that flat and set this aside just for a moment. And we need buttons. I got three things in this bag, but I'm not going to be using the USB C mod today. Um, already got a few videos on those, including when I did the last one. Um, we'll get it another time. I've got new membranes from Funny Playing and the new buttons from Funny Playing as well. I'm going to try out both of those. This time without the uh, LED mod. See how they feel. Oh, I had that right. Okay. Just gotta get these snipped off. It comes with a new volume slider, but we probably won't be using it because not all of them are replaceable. I suppose what better time to check than right now, though? What am I missing? Brightness button. I never liked the brightness button. In case that wasn't obvious for me, excluding it in my sleet. It always seems silly to dedicate a whole button for one function that you almost never use. Uh, if your console has a little bit of cloth over the speaker, make sure to include that. That does serve a purpose. Um, mine doesn't. I don't know if that's just because this console didn't have one or if it's because I've been in here before and stole it for another console. Alright. Before plugging that in, let's take a look at this. On the volume slider, if you give that a little wiggle and that thing feels like it's on there solid, don't bother trying to remove it, it's not coming off. Um, some of them are removable, most of them aren't, in my experience. Uh, and if you try removing it anyway, then um, you could break the volume slider off, and that's, that's kind of annoying to fix, so we'll just live with it. Uh, ooh, ooh, ooh. went to insert that and the, the wire got caught on the screw post. I did not notice until right after I creased it. No. Okay. Good enough. Three more short screws for the motherboard. That one just looks longer. I don't know what it is. 
We're gonna skip it. Especially careful about over tightening those or you'll do exactly what I just did and hit the other side. Um, I didn't cause a, a nubbin or a divot or anything but you can still clearly see a little white dot where the screw scratched up against the, the back side. The other two I did a little bit better and the last one of these I did, this uh, blue one was fine, so just pay extra close attention to that and uh, should be fine. Don't just do it on autopilot. All right, what are we missing? We're missing the shielding. The little circles to poke out in the insulation. Need those. Oh, what am I doing? I have a way better screwdriver. We're going to use two of the long ones because that's what we have left and because these screw posts can take long screws. Power switch in the bottom. Put the square nut. This is the battery cover retainer. Uh, sometimes they're directional, this one is not. This goes in. Good lord. This one goes right in there. Now we need to get the springs in the shoulder buttons. The springs are direction excuse me. The springs are directional. So if you try and put it in one shoulder button and it doesn't fit, either try the other shoulder button or the other spring. Just drop that in there and then we can slip that under the catch. Just like that. And then make sure that's switched off and that's switched off and then we can uh, just drop it in over top. Four long screws for the four corners. That 
and then same thing, just bottom out the screw, and then back it up quarter turn. And all is well. And then the two short screws, one for the battery compartment. And the other for the cart slot. Make sure that is fully installed or you will be scratching the back of your carts. And from here we've got the little um, uh, screw covers. Not reuse the original ones if you wanted to because these are all um, different sizes compared to stock. And oh, I should have paid better attention. I don't know which is which, uh, but if you clip all five off, there are three and then two. The two big ones go in the corners, but the regular short ones. Go in the middle and the other corners, but the big ones go in the top left and top right. And the purpose of these, whether you like them or not, since they clearly aren't actually hiding the screws. Oh, that one's not actually transparent. Interesting. Um, is so that when you close the SP, the covers are preventing the two halves of the plastic from rubbing on each other and scratching the crap out of itself. Uh, almost, almost any used SP has the exact same stuff. That's why you see these patterns on the paint here on both the top and the bottom and conveniently they match up because guess what? It was closed and it was rubbing. Um, even though these have guards, you know, you put this thing in your pocket, it's still gonna, still gonna squeeze together. It is what it is. There's only so much that can be done. Well, everything feels pretty good. I think we're good to go. Just got to clean up this absolute mess. Uh, I suppose we can use... Nah. Hang on, I've got something. Hmm. I've got these replacement pill logos. The one that the shell comes with, it's fine if that's what you want. It's nice and flat, it'll fit in the cutout nicely, but I've also got these, um, which are well, like bubble shape. I don't know, it's kind of hard to, kind of hard to capture, but I like them and I want to, I want to play with them. I think it's neat. And you can see that it is kind of angled there. Anyway, let us carry on. That right there. That right there. Plug my game in. Hey, it works. Not that I expected any different, but it's always nice confirmation. Anyway, uh, I'm going to do the stock test again, just it's a calibration measure. Uh, this thing is pulling 3.7, uh, I'm sorry, I'm pushing 3.7 volts, but it's pulling um, 
96 to 91 milliamps, which is pretty much the same as before. If we press, now that I have it soldered up, if we press the brightness button at the lowest brightness, uh, it is, I think I saw 71 to 75 milliamps. Oops, 76 to 72. No, 71 to 76. Okay, and there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight brightness levels. One, two, four, five, six, seven, eight. I think that's eight. I don't even know how to count to eight. Um, all right, so at max brightness, this thing pulls 147 to 145 to 151 milliamps. Um, quite a bit. That's not great, but probably won't be using it at max brightness because this is really bright. Uh, but anyway, if we hold the um, brightness button, we get an on-screen display. Ah, yeah. um, but we can use this to do the same thing for brightness. You can see there are eight levels there. Um, a short press toggles the options. A long or a medium press toggles between the uh, settings there. We're gonna leave that on zero and that on zero. I just wanna show you what they do. The XST and YST are for alignment. Brightness is brightness. And then FRM, oh, good Lord. <laughs> there we go. Uh, <laughs> brightness is brightness. XST is the X position and Y and left and right. And then YST is Y position. And then FRM is a feature that they ported from the 3.0 IPS kit, and it does the exact same thing here as it does there. Uh, it looks like it's on by default, so even though there is an OSD, you probably don't ever really need to actually use it, um, because the alignment is... I mean, it, it's laminated, so unless the screen's crooked, it's pretty fine where it is. Um, but otherwise, the FRM feature is one of the new things that I wanted to check out. I think it's pretty neat. Um, where are we at? Let's set that back to brightness 8. I can see max at 152. I'm going to toggle that off and see if the power usage changes significantly. And with FRM off, max brightness, the console's pulling about 146 to 149 milliamps. Oh, I saw it peak at 150 and Valley at 145. Um, so it looks like it does affect the power usage a little bit, which is interesting because these features usually don't do that. Um, but this one seems to do that, but it's such a minuscule amount that I, you know, I, I don't think you'd ever actually notice a difference in battery life. So no real harm in leaving it on. Uh, but anyway, I think that's enough of that. Let's go ahead and get this put away and let's do some more testing. And now that everything is assembled, Now that everything is tested, we can finish assembly. Because you know how it is. It's bad juju to finish assembling without even turning it on at least once. Um, let me actually pause for a moment and get this cleaned up. Eh, just like magic. Anyway. Oh, oh there it goes. That was weird. Okay. I totally forgot to plug in the flash cart anyhow. See, that screw is not all the way in. My cart got stuck when I went to pull it out. I had to slip my fingernail in there to create a little bit of a gap. 
And who for the uh, no. is clearly more dead than I thought. Okay. Uh, let's try 240p test suite. We can explore some of the features. So first up, grid, you can see the alignment is, I don't want to say perfect because nothing's ever perfect, but realistically you can't get better than that. Um, all of this I expect to perform pretty similarly to the GBA version of this kit, um, especially the laminated one. Some color bar examples there. Uh, I suppose that's meaningless since I don't actually color grade my footage though. Um, anyway. So this is the shadow sprite test. I've explained this dozens of times, but what's one more? Um, so the original Game Boy didn't have any way of achieving transparency on the screen. Um, not without doing some freaky deaky hacks, and that's exactly what a lot of original Game Boy devs did. Uh, they took advantage of a quirk of the original LCDs and their terrible pixel response times and they just flickered sprites on and off about as fast as they could which is exactly why this bad boy right here is flickering or at least I can see it in person can't really see it on the preview that I'm filming but usually they work out so I'm gonna I'm gonna have some faith that you guys can see that flickering um anyway that was how they achieved transparency. The awful pixel response time masked that. Uh, these screens are a little bit better than OEM screens. Um, not much, the pixel response is still kind of trash, but it's fine. Anyway, you can see that flickering there because they are better. Um, but this is exactly what the FRM feature is supposed to fix. So we flip that on and now you can see flicker be gone. Just like that, it's, it's magic. I do see a little bit of weird artifacting when I move the screen. I think that's just my eyes catching the effect that's going on here, how funny playing is using the FRM feature. Uh, but also when I move it up and down, I can sort of see some lines appear in that block. But when it's still, and when I'm not moving it, I don't see those lines. But when I move it, like the actual console itself, that's why I'm shaking it up and down. Uh, or when I move the block on screen, I see those lines appear. Kind of weird, but sure. Uh, here we can take a look at the scaling a little bit more closely, which this screen is actually not using any scaling, it's one-to-one. -one. Uh, so you can see the vertical scaling, the horizontal scaling, and then both. And you can see all of the blocks are nice and even, everything seems to be working nicely. Um, no major light bleed, it's great. So. Yeah, I think I think that's pretty much it. Um, it's a nice improvement over the original. Uh, personally, it never bothered bothered me to begin with because I don't really play games that use um, that transparency effect, or at least the ones that I do play. It's not really prominent, so it's not really distracting. Uh, but there are a couple notable exceptions here. Ooh, that's not the right Mario game. That's not either. Uh, uh oh. There it is. It's in my other console. That Mario game. <laughs> uh, but also that bad boy, and we'll take a look at one more in just a second. So I'm pretty pleased with the performance, but let's show a few more comparisons here. So I'm going to start with the low-hanging fruit that is Zass. 
I personally don't really care for this game, but this game uses, no, this game relies on that transparency effect for the entire background. So here's an example with FRM on. You notice, looks fine, totally playable. Everything's great. Now let me flip FRM to off. And you see now the background's flickering a little bit. It's really not that bad though. Like yeah, it's flickering, but it's not... I wouldn't consider it unplayable. Not in the slightest. Yeah. Uh, we can try this on... Do I have her? Do, 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 do. Of course I don't have one handy. Why would I have one handy? Uh, what's in here? I think this will be a good comparison. Compared to how IPS kits normally handle this game, this kit in this Game Boy doesn't have any sort of uh, frame motion blending or anything like that, frame blending. Uh, so this is pretty much how these things normally handle it. This is actually a lot better than, uh, this wasn't the best example. I mean, there's still quite a bit of flicker, but. It ain't great. Let me grab another Game Boy, hang on. Okay, so here I've got the engineering sample of the Funny Playing 3.0 IPS kit that doesn't even have um, the OSD or anything. Uh, and definitely doesn't have FRM implemented. And you can see exactly how flickery this is. This is distracting. This is bad. That is probably worst case scenario, and this is, for the most part, how most of these IPS kits handle this effect. Sorry, I had... I have all of my Game Boys set aside with battery mods in them, and they're all dead, intentionally, for something else. I promise I'll get to it eventually, but this was the only one that wasn't dead. <laughs> um, anyway, it, it seems fine. I don't mind it. Uh, ITA seems to handle that nicely. Let's try... Quickly show off Legend of Zelda real quick. Uh, even though that's going to show us the exact same results, I expect... Oh god, what did I just start? That's great, but now what I want. Zelda.gb So, same thing, you see this guy's chain. Um, exact same effect that I've explained before, it's flickering because it's supposed to be transparent, um, but if we turn FRM on, suddenly it stops flickering. Even though it wasn't, it wasn't that bad to begin with, but now it's not flickering at all and is actually transparent, so. Yeah, it is what it is. Next, we'll do Super Mario. So this game is kind of weird. Uh, these NES classics, I'm gonna start with FRM off, are partially emulated. I don't know the exact uh, technology behind it. I don't know exactly how it's working. I know it's running native code on the GBA, not exactly an emulator. Uh, but it's also rendering at a higher resolution and then being squashed down to fit the GBA's resolution. 
which if this game were coded from scratch, they wouldn't have done that. But they didn't code this game from scratch. It's an NES port. Um, and the NES just had higher resolution. Anyway, uh, one of the effects of that is some of these art, uh, sprites on screen are constantly shifting up and down a little bit as the scaling tries to make everything fit. And because some of these screens are particularly sensitive to flickering, um, you'll see artifacting on screen. ITA is susceptible to flickering, you know, you can still see a lot of the flickering, but at least it's not leaving artifacts behind. Uh, so if you look at the clouds and you look at the ground as it's moving around, you can especially see that in those objects. But if I come back here and turn FRM on, try and hold this steady. You can see, and there's still a little bit of flicker, but that's kind of just how this game works, but there's a lot less of it. Oh, I messed that up, but it doesn't matter. See? It's, uh... Seems to work fine. Pretty good. One more cart. But first, we're going to start with this Game Boy. This is the uh, original ITA kit. Um, I don't remember if it's the one that came out on release or like a minor update or whatever, but either way, this one does not have an OSD or FRM. It's not even laminated. But if we pop into Mario Kart, one thing in particular that people have been pointing out and complaining about is the shadows in this game. So if you hit the shoulder button, if you make the character jump, and if you look at the shoulder, or the shadow, you can see there's lines in it. It's not exactly solid gray. That's kind of expected behavior, but if we try the same thing on this one, Oh god, I hope the shoulder button works. Make him jump. You can see he's nice and gray. So, there's that fixed. And if we swap FRM off and then make him jump again, you can sort of kind of see it. I don't know, it looks, looks different on this one. It's more flickery, less individual lines, but... It is there. Either way, with it on, it's fine. I like it. Good enough. Alright. Last up, we're going to test one final thing and then I shall release you from your burden. No longer have to keep watching a Mako video. How terrible. Oh, I didn't... Okay. Uh, we want... The aging ROM. I want to go to the flicker adjuster. You can see there is plenty of flicker with this test pattern. That's kind of just how this pattern works. And we have FRM on. On and off makes zero difference here. Because this flicker is actually derived from a different function here. And... We're going to take advantage of the fact that I don't think this is good for the console, but you can certainly do this. As long as it's plugged in and charging, you can just pop the battery out and it won't actually shut down. But we can adjust the voltage going to the screen. I think this is not the right screwdriver. Let me get one that fits a little bit better. And I'm just going to jam that in there and then slowly twist one way until the flicker goes away. 
just like that. Easy. Reinstall the battery. Restart charging because I'm fairly certain that bugs the charging profile, but look at that. No more flicker. Works great. So this particular ROM that I just ran is called the uh, AGS Aging uh, Test Cart. I don't know. Uh, the file name is that if you want to search for it, um, but it is actually a Nintendo ROM, so I you know, can't really share it that way, hence the giant Nintendo logo on it. Um, but works great. I recommend checking out the cuttingroomfloor.net. You might be able to find something there. Um, works great. It's nice for for mods like this where you do actually have to calibrate them, uh, but it's also nice for OEM Game Boys like AGS 101s here um, because those need calibration. OEM screens, all of them, are calibrated to the console itself. So anytime you replace an OEM screen, you need to recalibrate it. SPs are a little bit easier or a little bit harder depending on your point of view because you could just plug it in and pop the battery out. Um, Game Boy Advance consoles are easier in that you can leave them powered, but you have to remove the sticker to do so because there's a little hole in the housing right there. You can indent the sticker. Uh, you can stick your screwdriver in to dial that in, and then Game Boy Colors have it in the battery compartment as well. But I don't actually have a Game Boy Color at near my desk. Okay, it's not an assembled one, but good enough. Um, right in the battery compartment, right under that sticker. At least OEM consoles have a sticker over it. Aftermarket consoles don't come with that sticker, but right there right under the latch. And you can adjust it. Game Boy Pockets and DMGs. Oh god. Game Boy Pockets and original Game Boys. Um, the potentiometer isn't in the battery compartment, it's just on the side of the Game Boy itself. Uh, so this is a bad example because this isn't actually a Game Boy Pocket. But that's what this contrast wheel, what, well, Game Boy Pockets normally have a contrast wheel right there. That's what that is. Exact same thing. Um, it's just the voltage needs to be tweaked a little bit as the batteries drain and so on. They're just a little bit more sensitive. Uh, but Game Boy Color and Onward, they got that kind of dialed in and you just need to adjust it the one time. And so they moved the potentiometer to a place where you're not going to accidentally mess with it. Otherwise... That's pretty much it. Um, ITA kits, I suppose I can explain a little bit more. Um, ITA kits, because they're Sharp manufactured, the, the manufacturer is the company Sharp, um, because they're manufactured by Sharp for Nintendo consoles with approximately the same specifications, you know, they're already the same frame rate, they're a little bit higher resolution, but most importantly, they're using the same control volta voltages for the screen. This screen is just pulling voltages that the Game Boy is already generating. Um, so you just got to tweak those a little bit. It's something like negative 13 and positive 15 volts or something ridiculous like that. I totally forgot offhand. Uh, but you got to tweak it a little bit. Just get the values dialed in. Um, IPS kits on the other hand, like for example the 3.0 kit that Funny Playing also makes, those don't need to be dialed in because all of the regulators that the screen needs are in the board itself because they're just not compatible at all with what the Game Boy is generating. Um, so it makes sense. It is a little bit of a bummer that they can't just dial it in from the factory, but I get why they do it. And yeah, it's more efficient in the end run. If you have redundant voltage regulators, you're burning extra power through generating voltages that you're not using. 
So if this screen ribbon were to generate those extra voltages, it, I mean, the Game Boy is already generating them. Why not just use them and tweak them a little bit? But that's why they can't dial it in. That's why the 40 pin version on the Game Boy Advance, you need to lift that uh, capacitor, so on. Long story, but hope that makes sense. Uh, anyway, highly recommend getting that dialed in. It's going to be a lot better once you do so. I suppose I should run those color tests again real quick in 240p. Nah, we don't need to save that. And so, there's my color bars. Everything's about the same as that. More color bars. Everything's still about the same. But overall, everything's pretty solid. Uh, one thing I'm noticing, mostly because I'm holding it at an angle, and I think when I look at it spot on, dead on, it's better. But if you aren't looking at the screen at the optimal angle, the colors kind of suck on it. It's fine. It's usable. But for someone filming videos, you know, if I want to get the color correct on camera, it looks like crap for me. It's really not an issue for actually playing because you'll hold it at the angle that looks best, but... My eyes and the camera are in two different places, so it is what it is. Um, IPS kits are a little bit better about that. That's not an IPS kit. That is. But even then, the viewing angles on this screen are kind of weird. It's better. But not optimal. Anyway, I think that's about all I've got. Um, I want to give thanks to Retro Game Repair Shop for sending all this stuff my way to check out. They sent me the housing, the buttons, um, the screen kit to play with. They've, they've been really good to me. Um, I, I appreciate them providing this stuff for me to check out and they get some value out of it too because they get my feedback. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't even know where I'm going with this. I'm losing my train of thought. It's hour 22 minutes later. Um, yeah, they get my feedback. They relay that feedback to Funny Playing if there's an issue. Or, you know, sometimes I, I think of a different way to do things that helps them out. And at the end of the day, they're still getting my video that they link on their site. Um, and that helps people install kits. So, you know, mutually beneficial as far as I can tell. So I will go ahead and link to them down in the description if you want to check this kit out. Uh, by the time this video goes up, they should be listed and available for purchase. Um, hopefully not out of stock, but I know the first batch that they're going to be carrying is going to be very small because of that particular issue with the um, backlight kit ribbon, how that needs to be soldered up. I know Retro Game Repair Shop was very against pushing that onto the customers, and they they said something to Funny Playing before I even mentioned it, so <laughs> that was nice of them. But anyway, uh, early adopter tax and all. Uh, but anyway, I think that's all I've got. Uh, I will go ahead and update my spreadsheet with the power usage numbers, and I will go ahead and measure the brightness of this thing and add that into the spreadsheet as well. Um, I will also eventually update my wiki because I have a write-up on every single backlight kit that I've done so far and a few others as well. And overall, I'm pretty impressed with this. It's, it's certainly a better option than the DIY ITA that I showed. Hmm. I suppose one more thing, I will compare the shells a little bit because this one on the DIY ITA that I did, um, this was a, a um, engineering sample. So they already had the mold mostly finalized, but there were still a few things to work out. For starters, the screw posts were a little bit too shallow for the motherboard screws. They've largely fixed that with the retail version. Uh, another issue that I had was um, the plastic wasn't flowing properly in the mold for these speaker holes and it was leaving these ugly marks on there. They fixed that too. Um, 
those were the big criticisms. Uh, otherwise, you know, they were, they were missing the screw covers, but I guess they just didn't include screw covers with this engineering sample. Maybe they weren't done yet. Um, battery cover screw wasn't, um, it wasn't captive. There we go. Uh, so what that means is the screw cover, the screw itself has a little C-clip on the back that holds it in so you can take it out without having to worry about losing it. But they fixed that too. So realistically, they've fixed all of my complaints. I'm actually really pleased with these shells now. Uh, the fitment around the hinge area, I think it could use a little bit of work still. It's not perfect, but it's such, it's such a minute thing. Like it's such a, a detail. I don't know how they would fix that. Um, it's unchanged from the engineering sample, but it's still a lot better than a lot of aftermarket shells. It could be is still just a hair of improvement. Just close that little panel gap there. And it'd be good, I think. Um, otherwise, it's really solid. I'm really happy with it. I think these are my new favorite SP shells. I wish my housing wasn't pinching that ribbon because now I gotta go take this apart and reposition that. Yeah, weird, weird panel gaps. Um, I guess if I had to find a complaint, it's that they don't come with stickers, or at least mine didn't. Um, this one didn't either, so I'm guessing they don't. It is what it is. Um, on this engineering sample, I used aftermarket stickers anyway because I thought clear on clear would be sick, and I think I was right. And I'll probably do the exact same thing here because that's neat. And Funny Playing probably wouldn't pack in clear stickers anyway. Anyway, if you leave me to it, I will ramble all night. So that's all I've got. Links in the description. Thanks for watching. Catch you all next time.